We started last Sunday talking about uh, consider the source. It's important that we are very, very careful who we listen to because there are all kinds of voices in this world trying to tell us what to believe, where we came from, where we're going. And uh, these voices are loud. They're everywhere. And they've made their way into our educational system, uh, the media, sciences, everything is just polluted with the words of people that want nothing to do with God or his word. And we looked at Romans chapter 1, which is up as the first slide. Romans chapter 1, which describes the people that uh, are telling us what to believe and telling us where we came from and where we're going and if they believe there's a God or claim to believe there's a God, how to relate to God and if they believe there's a life after death, how we get there. And it's all convoluted and it's all corrupt and it will never lead you to the truth. Because as we see in this slide, these are the, some of the characteristics from Romans chapter 1. These are people that are ungodly, completely negative toward God. They are filled with all unrighteousness. They hate the truth. They, when they hear it, they suppress it. They don't want to have anything to do with it. There was a time when they knew God. They refused to glorify him and honor him uh, as God and were not thankful. They became vain in their imaginations, void of any truth, completely vain and void of truth. And uh, they ended up in darkness. They became fools, that is, without any understanding. They made a horrible exchange where the ex they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they believe the lie. And they're convinced that the lie is the truth. And they try to propagate the lie. And unfortunately, way too many people are responding positively to the lie and not responding positively to the truth. And then we see at the end of Romans chapter 1 that God just gave them up and gave them over to a reprobate mind and to do the things that, that they wanted to do, and things went from bad to worse. These are the people that the world wants us to listen to. And as it relates to God and his truth and our relationship with God, we cannot listen to these people because they're the wrong source. So in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, that's where we have the right source. And there's only one right source for today. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul is speaking to Timothy, and he says the things, and that word things is important because we see that word in the context of other things that are taught in Scripture that are not for us. Paul says, Timothy, the things you have heard of me, the th those commit, those things which you have heard of me, commit to faithful men because those faithful men will take those things and teach those to others, and that's the way God propagates the truth from generation to generation, and that's why we have it today. So the things that we've heard from the Apostle Paul. Now, as just reviewing these three points, you notice that Paul did not say the things you have heard of Moses. He said, the things you've heard of me. He did not say, the things you've heard of the 12. That's getting a little closer to what people are listening today. People listen to Moses and they go back to law. We saw that in Galatians on Sunday. But people are saying, we've got to listen to the Lord Jesus Christ and his earthly ministry. We've got to get our lessons on how to live from the Gospels. Well... Paul doesn't say the things you've heard of the 12 because those are the things that the Lord Jesus Christ taught the 12. 
So it's not the things, and th this gets a little touchy because people say, well, wait a minute, you're telling me not to listen to the Lord Jesus Christ? It's exactly what we're saying. And that's exactly what Scripture says. When Paul says, the things you've heard of me, those are the things that you're to commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The things you've heard, not of Christ in the flesh in his earthly ministry, but of Paul. And we're going to look at this for a few minutes. So the things you've heard from Moses, and uh, God communicated those to the children of Israel through Moses, and uh, they were to communicate those to others. Just one passage that we saw last Sunday as it relates to these things that Moses received from God. He said, you need to teach those to others. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, God gives them the pattern on how they were to propagate the things that Moses heard from God and that the people of Israel heard from Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's capital L-O-R-D, which is the Jehovah God. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words which I command you these days. So it's these things that I command you today and that I've written in these books. These words which I command you this day shall be, first of all, in your heart. And once they're in your heart, you shall teach them diligently to your children. That was God's design on how to keep the word of God communicated from generation to generation. You shall teach them diligently, not just lightly, not just in happenstance. No, diligently unto your children, and you will talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. That really includes everything you do throughout the day. Is In every circumstance that you live in, everything you encounter each day, you're supposed to keep teaching these things as a way of life. These were things that we were to be kept in the front of their minds always. Moses said, these are the things that you need to have in your heart. And once they're there, you need to commu the, communicate these things to your children and in every circumstance. And then they will communicate those to their children. So that's the pattern. So we have for the children of Israel, we have all of the laws and instructions that God through Moses gave to the children of Israel. Those were the things that they were to meditate on. Those were the things they were supposed to listen to and obey and tell their children from generation to generation to generation. All of the laws and the prophecies that were given even just by Moses in the first five books of the Bible. We have all the laws and instructions and the prophecies that were given regarding the nation of Israel and their future. Well, there was a problem, as we saw last Sunday, with the Galatians. They, at one point, understood the grace message. They received it, and then... Some people came, the Judaizers came, and said, yeah, that's okay, but you need to add law works to grace, and you need to be circumcised, and they were fleshly in their communication. We saw many passages in Galatians how the Galatians went back to Moses and fell from grace. They were bewi bewitched. Paul calls them foolish. He says, you have been, you have been completely duped into believing something you ought not to believe, and you are thus disobeying the truth. What truth? The truth that they received from the Apostle Paul because they had heard the things that Paul communicated, and they had believed them, and they were living by them. So that was a problem. 
And uh, today we have people that try to go back under law. They try to go back and uh, trying to keep the Ten Commandments. If you, just, if you just live by the Ten Commandments, you will be fine. You'll have good relationships. Well, that's not the rule that God wants us to follow. In fact, the Apostle Paul, in summary, says many things, but in summary says, you know, sin is not going to have dominion over you because you're no longer under law, but under grace. Grace is a whole new rule of life. And uh, if you study the book of Romans, you study the book of Galatians, and other of uh, Paul's letters, you'll see what the purpose of the law was and the fact that they were never supposed to go back to law. That was the pro problem with the Galatians. So consider the source, who you listen to. Now let's look at the 12 and uh, Jesus in his earthly minister, uh, in his earthly ministry. We saw in Romans chapter 15, verse 8, that Jesus came, Paul says that Jesus came in order to minister to the, as a minister of the circumcision, to confirm the promises made to the fathers. John 1 says, he came unto his own. His own received him not. So clearly, the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry came to communicate and to confirm the promises that were made unto the fathers. And the things that the twelve heard from Jesus, were they were to go and teach all nations. The things that they heard from Jesus, they were to go out and communicate. Look at Matthew chapter 28 for a moment. People call this the Great Commission. It's a commission, but it's not the commission for the church, the body of Christ. Because later on, in Galatians chapter 2, this commission goes out of commission because uh, God started a new program, put this program on hold. And uh, what we see in Matthew 28, this is the end of Jesus' ministry, earthly ministry. He uh, commissions the 12, and he said, look, here's what I want you to do. Verses 19 and 20, go ye therefore and teach. Teach what? We'll find that out in verse 20. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Here we go. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. The things that Christ commanded them while he was here on earth, they were to take those and teach, broadcast that message, which was God's plan. These things, whatsoever I have commanded you. Now that's pretty broad, but it's also very restrictive. It's restricted to the things that Jesus taught the disciples, the apostles, while he was here on earth. Teaching them, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. So this you know, there was absolutely, there was nothing remotely close to what Paul taught. Not in Jesus' teaching. He never spoke of the body of Christ. He never spoke about things that are true of us today. In fact, the Apostle Paul makes a point of saying that these things were hidden until they were revealed to the Apostle Paul. This is the wisdom of God which is revealed in a mystery. This is what you might say is the preaching of Jesus Christ when Jesus was here according to the revelation of prophecy. Today, it's a revelation, it's the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. So here we have it. Jesus' own words to the 12 was, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to Go to all nations, and I want you to teach them the things that I have already in my earthly ministry with you. I've already commanded you. Those are the things that you're supposed to teach. And that's why Paul doesn't say the things you've heard of the twelve or the things you've heard from Jesus in his earthly ministry. These things commit to faithful men. Absolutely not. 
That's why Paul says the things you've heard of me. And so we need to be very careful who we listen to. Now, the things that the 12 heard from Jesus were, as we just read in Matthew 28, but what were those things? Well, Jesus started by teaching them the gospel of the kingdom. We read in the book of Acts that the kingdom was promised and revealed since the world began. Constantly, there was reference to, there was promises relating to the kingdom that, was, that God was going to set up, a literal, earthly, eternal kingdom. And that was the hope of Israel. That was the salvation of Israel. And those are the things that the Lord Jesus Christ taught. For centuries, this kingdom was prophesied. Now John the Baptist comes on the scene, and the Lord Jesus Christ comes on the scene, and they say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let's look at a few passages so that you don't have to believe me. You go to the scripture and see what the word of God says. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means it's just about here. And it was, in fact, being offered to the nation of Israel, and it was officially offered to the nation of Israel. They rejected it, but from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, look, repent, and uh, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In verse 23, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and the signs of the kingdom which were part of this message, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And then in chapter 9 and verse 35, once again, there's no question about the message that the Lord Jesus Christ pe preached. Matthew 9, 35, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues. He came unto his own. He came to confirm the promises to the circumcision made to the fathers, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Now, he says, okay, now I'm going to commission, set aside charge 12 men to propagate this message. And that's what we find in chapter 10. Chapter 10, we have the list of the 12 apostles. And in chapter 10, verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, go, in, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's the focus of our ministry now. And as you go, preach, saying, these are the words, and the words are important, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he gave them the powers of the signs of the kingdom. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, Freely you have received, freely give. And he instructs them how to live in this new setting that he put them into, in this new task and commission that he gave to them. And these are the things that Jesus says, these are the things that you to teach, because these are the things yet that you've heard of me. Then what else did the Lord Jesus Christ do? Well, as we've been studying the book of Matthew, we have seen clearly that the Lord Jesus Christ is preparing them for life in the kingdom. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is about. That's what the Beatitudes are all about. It's preparation for what life will, in fact, be like in the kingdom. So these are not things that 
Paul says, the things you've heard of Jesus in his earthly ministry, these commit to faithful men? Not at all. Something totally different. Jesus taught them what life was going to be like in the kingdom, and they needed to have a focus on believing who Jesus was. Today, we are saved by believing what Jesus did, his work on the cross. That is not what the 12 believed. That's not what people during Christ's earthly ministry believed in order to be justified unto eternal life. We referred to this on Sunday in Matthew 16, where Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And uh, Peter said, well, they're saying you're the prophet, you're Elijah, you're somebody else. But who do you say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. They needed to know and believe who he is. In uh, Matthew chapter 26, Matthew chapter 26 and uh, verse 63. And this is when he's before the high priest. In verse 62, the high priest arose and said to him, don't you answer? And this is when they accused him of, you know, taking down the temple and building it up in three days. And they said, don't you answer anything? What is it which these witnesses are saying against you? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. They didn't believe it. They didn't respond positively to that message, but that's what they needed to believe and yet refused to believe. But that was the key issue. Who is he? He is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of the Living God. He is deity, God in the flesh. That's what they needed to believe. John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, uh, we have another instance, and there are many in the Gospels that give evidence to the fact that what they needed to believe was that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. In Genesis chapter, in, I'm sorry, in John chapter 11, this is the encounter with Martha when uh, Jesus was going to raise her brother Lazarus from the dead. And uh, Jesus said to her, verse 23, your brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, and here it is, I am. They needed to believe who he was. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. That's her genuine, legitimate profession of faith. She knew who he was by faith. God revealed it to her, just like God revealed it to Peter. Jesus told him that in Matthew 16. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. She believed it, and she acknowledged that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. We made reference on Sunday also to the reason that John wrote the Gospel of John in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Many other signs did Jesus in the presence uh, in, um, and many other signs, verse 30, truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, listen to this, you might have life through his name. That becomes a very important concept. Because the name 
is what represents who he is. They called him Jesus. Why? Because he was going to save his people from their sins. He is the Savior. So there are many instances where we see the name as being critical. If you go to Acts chapter 4, we're still in Israel's program here. The church, the body of Christ, is not in existence. And in chapter 4, verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name, none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Salvation is in his name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is. He is the Christ, the son of the living God. And you see that throughout the Gospels. They needed to believe who he was. That is not the way we're saved today. Paul's Gospel is Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. When the, when the apostle Paul and Silas were in the Philippian jail, uh, the jailer said, what must I do to be saved? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What did he mean by that? Not just that he was the Christ, the son of the living God, it's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. At this point, Paul is beginning to reveal his message, beginning to reveal that Christ died for his sins and that he was buried and that he rose again from the dead. Believe that and you will be saved. And if your household believes that too, they will be saved because that is the message of salvation. So they needed to believe that. So not only did the Lord Jesus Christ come proclaiming a new message, the message of the kingdom being at hand and, uh, and revealing who he was, but he also prepared them for the tribulation because in God's prophetic program with the nation of Israel, the kingdom was at hand but there's something that preceded the coming of the kingdom, and that was the seven years of tribulation. So Jesus prepares them for the tribulation in Matthew chapter 24, and we have many instances in the Gospels where there's reference to the tribulation, but here in Matthew 24, there's a direct reference to the tribulation. Matthew 24, verse 21. And we're just breaking into these passages to make the point that what it is that Christ prepared them for and what was his message and what is it that he told them that they were supposed to go out and teach. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And uh, in Steve's brief overview of the book of Matthew, he has taught us uh, a lot of these verses. And we should not be mistaken by what this passage teaches. So, what, But what was Christ doing? He was preparing them for the coming tribulation which preceded the kingdom which was at hand. So if the kingdom was at hand, how much closer was the tribulation which was to come just before the introduction of the king of kings, the Lord Jesus Christ setting up his kingdom here on earth. Now, as the Galatians went back to Moses, the Galatians went back to Moses. They tried to keep the law, and they erred in it. And the Apostle Paul is brutal in the comments and the words that he uses to condemn them and to correct them. But as the Galatians went back to Moses, so there are people in the 
quote, evangelical church today that want to live by the things taught by Jesus in his earthly ministry. So there are messages, long messages, detailed messages on how the church, the body of Christ, should live according to the teachings of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. That's a complete misunderstanding of what Jesus taught there. He taught them what life would be like in the kingdom, the Beatitudes. And then you have the Lord's Prayer. I heard a, an individual who grew up in the dispensational movement, rightly dividing the word of truth. She went to a, a school function, and uh, she said it was so beautiful. They prayed the Lord's Prayer. And your heart sinks. Aren't we understanding? Aren't we getting? Aren't we appropriating, owning the truths of what it means to rightly divide the word of truth? The Lord's Prayer in, in Matthew chapter 6 has nothing to do with the body of Christ. Can we learn things from it? Absolutely. All scripture is for us. But only certain books, letters, are written to the body of Christ and are about the body of Christ. So we read and study God's program with the nation of Israel, and we see, we understand his love for people, his holiness, his long-suffering, his compassion, all of his attributes that are revealed throughout history. But God's plan and will and purpose for us today is revealed in the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to the churches. The Lord's Prayer uh, is used, and there are many books that have been written and mess many messages that have been used to say, and they call it this, they say, this is a pattern for our prayer. It is not. Take a few minutes to consider what the Lord's Prayer is. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, Jesus teaches the apostles, the disciples, he says, after this manner, manner therefore, you pray. This is the pattern for you. And there are major topics and subjects in this prayer. And it's, they're summarized in this prayer. And Jesus tells his disciples, this is what you're to pray. This is the pattern for you, for prayer. Well, you don't have to go very far into the prayer to realize that it is not for the body of Christ. Start with, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's a great thought for us as well. Honor God, glorify God, worship him as God. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Whoops. This is not the kingdom of God at his, as it comes down today and invades men. This is the kingdom that Jesus said he was preaching. The gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in Matthew 6, he says, pray, thy kingdom come. Now, why would they want the kingdom to come? Well, if we understand what Jesus prepared them for, which is the tribulation, which was an, will be an awful period of time, and the longing, the salvation of those who are going through the tribulation is the coming of the king to set up his kingdom, and that's why the longing of the Jewish heart and believer's heart during the tribulation is, oh, that thy kingdom would come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, that's a noble prayer to say, I want God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. But the reference here is that there will come a point in time during the kingdom when God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is not today. You cannot look very far into the world today to realize that God's will is not being done on earth as it is in heaven. 
only as it relates to individuals who believe the word of God as revealed by the Apostle Paul. That's the way God's will is being done on earth today is by doing exactly what Paul told us to do. The things you've heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Those are the things that accomplish the will of God for us today. But here in Matthew 6, there's a longing for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, and it will be when Christ comes to set up his kingdom. He sits on David's throne, and he rules in righteousness and perfect justice. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, praying uh, for food is not what God desires for us to do today. That is not the pattern. Here, Jesus say, pray after this manner. This is the pattern for you to pray. That's not our pattern because what God teaches us through the Apostle Paul is if you don't work, you don't eat. And if there is a legitimate need, the pattern for the believer who has needs is for the church to meet that need, to meet the needs of the poor. But God is not going to miraculously bring down manna from heaven. He's just not doing that. One day he will again, especially when they're in the tribulation and they, their little flock, the remnant, do not take the mark of the beast and therefore they cannot buy nor sell and they're out in the mountains having fled in the middle of the tribulation and just think of it you know think of the emotion of it it's one thing for you to be hungry but it's another thing for you to have your three-year-old little child and your five-year-old and and your seven-year-old hanging on to your hands and saying mommy daddy i am so hungry Well, what do they do? Well, that's when God says that he will feed them. He will miraculously provide for them as he did in the wilderness, the children of Israel, when he showered manna from heaven. That will happen again. And that's what they're supposed to pray because they're praying in keeping with what God is doing in that day. Give us this day our daily bread. So listen to the prayers of people that pray before you eat. And I'm not saying you shouldn't pray before you eat, but be careful what you pray. Pray with understanding. It's not thanking God for his miraculous provision for food. No, thank Dad for the fact that he went to work and he's got money to provide for food. It's not... God miraculously bringing food, it's God's program is different now. Now, There are other interesting prayers that go on at a meal. Bless this food to our bodies. Well, if you're eating junk, God is not going to interfere with that and cause you to be healthy and strong if you keep eating junk food. That's just cause and effect. So we need to pray with understanding. And then there's this great teaching in the Lord's Prayer, verse 12 of Matthew 6, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And as we, again, have learned in our study in Matthew, is that the way to live as members of the little flock, the remnant, is uh, through prayer, through forgiveness, and uh, to appropriate by faith the things that God has taught them. And so forgiveness becomes a big issue here. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I'm not sure that I always want God to forgive me as I forgive others. Because there are times that it's really hard to forgive others. The flesh gets in the way. But here... It's God's pattern for the nation of Israel, for the remnant, for the little flock. And then he elaborates on that. 
and he says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. And then he elaborates, he says, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye, um, if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now it's interesting that people repeat this over and over and over again. And the Lord Jesus Christ in this very chapter 6, he says, just don't do vain repetitions. Vain repetitions, that's empty. That's hollow. That's not praying. That's reciting words that you've memorized. And so there are many other lessons that the Lord Jesus Christ taught the disciples about prayer, which we try to take from Israel's program and we try to apply them to today. And we have millions of frustrated believers today because they're confused about prayer and they're frustrated because God is not answering their prayers or at best they make excuses for God and say, well, God didn't answer this prayer. He, he answered by saying, wait. Or he answered by saying, no. Well, God has clarity around what they're going to pray for they're to align with God's program for that day. And when they prayed for God to give them their daily bread, it was consistent with what God was doing, and he gave them their daily bread. He will during the tribulation period. Take uh, the incident of uh, the woman at the well. That's a great story, great incident of what happened. There's so much taught there. And there are people that say, you know, just why don't you just take stories like that and teach us how we're supposed to be kind and sweet and reach out to people that we don't like. Well, let's look at John chapter 4 and uh, see what it is exactly that is being taught in John chapter 4 through this incident of the woman at the well. Beginning with verse 3, we'll break in there. Jesus left Judea, departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Wait a minute. Uh, they weren't supposed to go to the Samaritans, nor to the Gentiles. And the legalists, the religious leaders, the vain religious system made a big deal out of that. Just like they made a big deal about the Sabbath, we've also learned through Steve's teaching, that the Sabbath was for refreshing and restoration, not to prolong suffering. And so the fact that he healed on the Sabbath was in keeping with his attributes, with his love and compassion, and with the purpose of what God is doing. So, verse 5, he comes to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat on the well. It was about the sixth hour. And this shows his humanity. He was tired. He was thirsty. He was hungry. So we learn about the humanity of God the Son. Verse 7, then comes a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me to drink. Now, Jesus had to go through Samaria, and he had to go there because there was a woman to reach and a city to have the message proclaimed to. Give me to drink, for his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask drink of me, who am a woman of Samaria? Two problems with this. He was not supposed to be seen with a woman in public, and especially, number two, a Samaritan woman. But there you have Jesus in his compassion, in his 
knowledge in his omniscience, knowing that this woman would be there, knowing that he would meet their need, her need, he goes to Samaria. So we learn the omniscience of God the Son. He knew. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me to drink? Wait a minute. What is it that she was supposed to believe? Consistent what we've seen through the Gospels, she needed to believe that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this is where he's leading her. If you knew who it is that says to you, give me to drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. That's grace. So now he's leading her to the living water, even though he's the one that was thirsty and asked her for a drink. The woman said to him, sir, you've got nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where do you have this living water? What are you talking about? Well, art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again this physical water, and there are constant references to transitioning from the physical to the spiritual. And Christ talking about spiritual things and people thinking he was talking about physical things. Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he can't be saved. He can't be right with God. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. Well, what does Nicodemus think? How am I going to get back into my mother's womb and be born all over again? He's stunned. Well, Jesus, that's not what I'm talking about. That which is flesh is flesh. That which is spirit is spirit. Here this woman says, he says, I'm going to give you living water. She says, well, what are you talking about? You have nothing to draw from, to draw from this well to get water. Jesus answered and said unto her, verse 13, Whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. And whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. See how he's making the transition from physical water to spiritual water? But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Everlasting life. Well, there's more here. It's great. The woman said unto him, Sir, that sounds great. You know, this poor woman had to come to the well regularly, work hard, take water out of the well, carry this all the way home so that she and her family would have to drink. And now comes somebody who says, look, if, if you drink of this water that I'm talking about, you're never going to thirst again. She says, man, that's a great deal. Give me, give me that so I never have to come back here and draw again. Imagine, water that quenches my thirst permanently. So give me this water that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. Now Jesus wants to, once again, as is consistent with why he met with her, he wants to show her who he is. He says, um, go call your husband and come here. Now, do you think he tried to embarrass her? No. He tried to bring this woman to the place where she acknowledged what? That he is the Christ, the son of the living God. How does he know whether she's married or not? Because he knows all things. He is God. And that's the conclusion she comes to later. He says, go call your husband and, and then come here with him. The woman answered and said, I don't have a husband. Well, partial truth, right? Now Jesus said unto her, yeah, you said the truth. You, you have well said you have no husband. 
As a matter of fact, you've had five husbands. Imagine, five husbands. And you're now living with number six, who's not your husband. Verse 18, you've had five husbands, and he whom now you now have is not your husband. And so, yeah, you, you've, he gives her the benefit of the doubt, and he says, you've told the truth, you don't have a husband. Now the woman says, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. You are saying things that no common man can say. Now she says, I, I want to talk about worship. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, woman, believe me, the hour comes when Ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you don't even know what you're worshiping. You don't know. We know what we worship. Oh, the distinction he's made, that's pretty offensive. Imagine telling somebody who worships, you don't know what you're worshiping. But you come to the Jews, my people, she knew he was a Jew. We know whom we worship because salvation is of the Jews. That's the pattern. Verse 23, but the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth for the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit. Look at the theology that he's teaching this woman of Samaria. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said unto him, I know that Messiah comes, ooh, which is called Christ. She's getting it. When he's come, he will tell us all things. And the light goes on. Wait a minute. She knew that when the Christ would come, the Messiah would come, he would tell us all things. What did Jesus just do? He told her about her personal life. He said, I know you don't have a husband. You've, f you've had five, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. And that's why Jesus came. That's why he brought up the husbands. And she comes to conclusions. She's, the lights are going on. He will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. I'm the one. I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. I'm able to tell you all things. And there's the lesson. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with a woman. How could he do that in public talking to a woman? Yet no man said, what seekest thou? Or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot. Why did she go there? She went there to fill her water pot. She now is no longer interested in why she came for originally because something else has happened to her. She's seen the light. The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and she said to the men, now, interesting, she, she's known by the men. What does she say? Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Now she becomes a witness for the Christ, the son of the living God. And she concludes that because the Christ, the real Christ, the Messiah, the son of God, was going to be able to tell us all things, he just told me everything about my life. He didn't really. He didn't go into great detail, but he went into the detail that mattered. And she says, come and see a man who's told me everything, all things, which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. What a great story. Now, when you teach the woman of Samaria, many lessons here. Number one, the, the love of Christ, that he would 
bypass a potential difficulty in his reputation because he went to talk to a woman. Worse than that, he went to talk to a woman in Sam of Samaria. And so we see the love of Christ for this woman, the burden that he was willing to bypass the whole vain religious system and go right to this woman in need. And he said, I, I must go to Samaria. So we learn about his love. We learn about his outreach to this woman in spite of what everybody else said. We learn about the deity of Christ. He's omniscient. He knows all things. Here's a man who told me everything I ever did. We see that the message there, you cannot teach this passage without teaching the truth. That the issue is that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, which in the context of the Gospels and in the context of why John wrote his Gospel, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Can't miss that when we teach this. And so then we see a woman that uh, who was converted, who believed, of all people, a woman of Samaria, when Jesus just got done telling her salvation is of the Jews. And we know who we worship. You don't. And she worships him. She serves him. She proclaims him. She goes to the city and tells him, come and see a man that told me everything I ever did. Her testimony, what he just, what she just experienced minutes before. And the first thing that she does is she goes out and tells the men of the city, come, come, you've got to hear him. You've got to come to him. And that's when you see a person who is genuinely converted to Christ. She can't keep silent. The enthusiasm, the joy the release in her life, that now she has something far better to offer than just physical water from the one who offered her living water. He is the living water which wells up in her into eternal life. This woman has eternal life. She's been justified. And by the way, she knows nothing about the death of Christ because that's not the way they were saved. Today we are because of the gospel that the Apostle Paul has revealed to us. My gospel, he says. What a great incident here that displays the attributes of God the Son and the love that he has and the clarity with which he brings her to faith. There was no question in her mind who this was. This is the Christ the son of the living God. And this is the one who we now know died for our sins, was buried, and praise God, he rose again the third day. And don't forget, don't forget what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.16, uh, we have known many in the flesh, but when it comes to the son of God, we no longer know him in the flesh. We do not follow the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. We do not follow the things that he told his disciples to teach others, all the things that they heard. Now, those are important things. They're for us. They're for our edification. And they, are, they strengthen us. They expand our understanding of God's love and God's program and God's plan through the ages. Yes, we learn from those things. But the message for us is the message that Paul said, the things that you've heard of me commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Okay, let's close in prayer.